actually. It looks like my Wi-Fi might be back on again. I'm just going to dip out and dip straight back in again, see if we can get a better connection. Two seconds. Okay, I think it worked. Right, hopefully everybody has a cup of something, feeling a little bit refreshed, ready for the next item. I'll just check. Uh, Ruth, are we okay? We're back on recording, hasn't stopped, has it? We're okay. We're fine, yeah. Okay, super. Right, okay, so we are on to item number six. Um, this is our integrated performance and quality report. I'll just make sure I'm open at the right page. Um, and as is tradition, I will ask David to uh, be the conductor of this orchestral piece um, with different people coming in to talk to the different sections. So I will hand over to you now, David, please. Thank you, and hopefully it will be a symphony as opposed to a cacophony, but uh, thank you for the introduction. And uh, hello everybody, and we review the IPQR today. It is presented uh, for uh, moderate assurance. Um, of course, our performance and our integrated performance is also linked to our, not only our strategy, but also uh, our ADP, of which the next topic will look at the latest submission of the ADP, but recognising there is already an existing uh, context there. A couple of items just to highlight that uh, I would bring to your attention from uh, the report. Um, the, uh, there is some improvement in the maternity section around uh, breastfeeding initiation that's uh, carried forward since the last um, update that was received from the board, so uh, that is uh, positive. Um, Cam's, uh, uh, sorry, I should all mention that uh, there was questions around uh, cesarean uh, rates and they are now included in uh, the report. Uh, Cam's continues to show uh, steady progress, both within long weights and short weights. Albeit, I would say those are marginal improvements from the last uh, time, but I think a sustained trajectory over the past uh, months. Uh, INDAS, however, that's a new developmental assessment service, um, is still an area that causes us uh, concern. And uh, I know there is intervention uh, going on in that space. Um, and you'll notice in particular the increase in referral rates. Um, and that obviously is a concern for the service and indeed uh, an area for uh, our attention. Uh, TTG remains largely on plan. You'll see the activity against our plan. Um, however, one watch out for us as we look at our outpatients uh, is the upward trend in referrals, uh, which will ultimately require both capacity uh, to treat patients and outpatients. Um, but also that there will be a knock-on effect likely uh, within TTG. So that's an area uh, that uh, we're looking at. Uh, cancer services has been an area and remains an area of focus for us. Um, a substantial item was taken to the last uh, Finance Resources and Performance Committee. Um, and uh, maybe just for note, Chair, there was an action I noted in the board action plan with regard to cancer services. It may well be that we feel as though that has been covered as the substantial item has been taken to uh, our FRP committee. Um, the good news is 31-day target is maintaining its high performance and we've been able to sustain that over the last uh, months. 94.4% is the latest. Uh, performance, 95% being uh, the target, um, so within rounding of uh, meeting that number. 62 uh, d uh, performance although it is lower as we recognise that has improved over uh, the last uh, couple of months since our uh, last report, but obviously that remains uh, challenging. 
Uh, delayed discharge is probably the area that um, uh, still has a big impact for us as a board, uh, both in regard to the patients that we care for, as well as the performance of the system. And uh, you'll see from there that the number has still not uh, turned the corner yet and uh, is uh, causing us concern, as well as uh, giving uh, us giving our attention to our unscheduled uh, care programme. We recognise it is extremely complex. There are many moving parts to it, and indeed there won't be any single solution to that. But um, I know Pam and her team, particularly within the Highland area, uh, has got that high on the priority list. Um, and finally, uh, psychological therapies um, continues to make uh, progress where our latest result is 86 point. 7% uh, uh, within uh, 18 weeks, which uh, takes us above the overall national performance, but still slightly below uh, target. So uh, we would look for that uh, progress to continue. So with those few uh, comments and highlights, I'm sure colleagues may have seen other items that they want to um, question or understand more and have more information around. So I'd invite questions at this stage and I'm happy to look for the support of my other exec colleagues to uh, provide some uh, additional information. Uh, Bert, if I can come to you first, please. Uh, thank you very much, David. Thank you for the report and for your summary uh, of the report. Um, I've got a couple of questions regarding adverse events and significant uh, adverse events. So in relation to adverse events, um, at every board meeting, um, the performance indicates uh, that there is still a concern um, about the number of uh, events on DATIX that are awaiting review. Um, and, and this has been going on now for a long time. Um, and the 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 summary uh, in the margin um, from from Boyd does indicate that some action is being taken. I'm just left wondering: um, is there a reason for this that isn't so obvious, uh, or is there a reason that is just absolutely obvious and it's just not being uh, dealt with? Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing is in relation to um, the significant adverse events. And I don't understand enough about duty of candor, but what I'm left wondering about and what I'm just interested in is do these significant adverse events uh, meet the threshold uh, to trigger duty of candor? Um, and, and is that actually happening? As I say, I don't understand or I don't know enough about duty of candor, but it's just a thought uh, that has occurred to me when I was looking at this. So uh, thank you for that, David. Thanks, Bert. Good questions. Um, let me come to uh, Boyd to address them. Thanks, Boyd. Thanks. Um, so first of all, on the adverse events, as I've commented before, this is been passed out because it sits within mainly the operational units um, where um, people are to look at data and to um, uh, assess them. Um, chief officers have looked at that and some of the feedback that I've had is that um, some of it is a phenomenon of um, multiple data entries for the same situation repeatedly. Um, where it would be better to cover it off in one. And what it gives is, since Datex is not a, a terribly rapid software system to go in and work through the stages and sign things off, it'll mean uh, a very repetitive task of on a large number of items that are all the same item effectively that could if they've been collated into one that would have been an easier sign off. And so there's a, a little bit of a practical factor, but they're working towards resolving that. Um, the other thing to say is that we do see the data in arrears, so we need to watch and see now as a board, we want to be assured that the data is coming in, and then we should see an in arrears pattern of improvement as the um, actions that have been advised by chief officers take place. 
So we need to watch the, the data and uh, I think the data, as you say, is showing it's still rising, but the feedback and hopefully the interventions are uh, ones that I've been I've received in the last two months. And so we would wait to see those appear over the next couple of iterations of this report. On the duty of candor, that's not itemised in this. And was, you should think of it separately. There's an annual duty of candor report which goes to clinical governance committee. That may be the thing that you really want to see, and um, it, um, uh, it 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 will overlap with things like significant adverse event reports. But there can be duty of candor situations where you don't do an SAER, and so the the two are not um, the one and the same, but they do have an overlap. Um, in that there will be duty of candor cases which uh, for which an SAER significant adverse event review is conducted, but others where there is a case review and there are other actions um, which mean that wouldn't appear in the SAER data. Uh, so and uh, the annual duty of candor report which comes to clinical governance committees, perhaps the thing that you would want to have a look at uh, with reference to your second question. And we can arrange for you to see that. Thanks, uh, Boyd. And yeah, just, uh, Bert, just maybe just to add one one thing to that. Certainly, the a couple of the discussions I've been involved in in terms of that clinical review when these items are raised first and the the clinical group review them, um, then duty of candor is a consideration right at the very start of that process before it goes through the formal route. So. Um, uh, it, it's very much at the forefront um, in terms of consideration. But uh, sorry, did you have a follow up? Um, no, it was just to say thank you for for the um, the response. Um, I, I will get access. Uh, I will ask to see the the report that goes to clinical governance. Um, and I guess just going back to the adverse events and and the numbers. I guess my concern is that if it's and I've probably said this before, it's, if it's taking a, a long time to deal with these things, my concern is, well, what happens if there's a repeat of these instances before we've reviewed um, an adverse event that has been recorded um, on Datex? But I guess I'm just saying what I've said before. Uh, anyway, thank you, David. Thanks, Bert. Boy, did you want to come back in? Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so where something is of immediate patient safety concern, then immediate actions would always need to be uh, looked at. Um, and um, the SER formalises and it is quite a formal process and it does take a long time to organise and then to complete. Um, so that's a sort of formal process um, which will cover, try to cover everything and to support learning and improvement. But there will usually, when a case occurs, there will be immediate actions that will later be reflected in the uh, significant adverse event re report. But those might have been those might have occurred uh, actions and interventions or at least assessments might have happened pretty well immediately. Um, they, they don't wait until the finalisation of the report before things are done. Um, there will sometimes be immediate, ob immediately obvious things that that would be implemented straight away. The aim of the process is to have a complete review of everything and to look across and connect uh, between the, the obvious bits that will have been spotted straight away and to try to fill in the gaps that sometimes can occur if you don't have a comprehensive review of something. And that's the aim. So, so the aim of the SER is not to deal with the immediate and obvious, but is to join the dots and thoroughly look through to um, these high tariff uh, cases, um, uh, look look carefully at all aspects <clears throat> and all connections, and that that um, that's some of the reason why it can take quite a long time to follow through in the formal process. Uh, so just to assure you that the immediate things do happen as immediately as they can feasibly uh, be done. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Bert. Thanks for your questions. Uh, Susan, can I come to you, please? 
Thank you, David, and thank you and your colleagues for, for the report and the, and the information we've got in that. Um, really pleased to see that we're starting to put some projections and, and some trajectories against some of the data, and, and that's really helpful. But I, I would like to understand a bit more about how those are how those are calculated. How do you decide what the projection looks like? Because some of them do look very similar for different areas. They, they look the same kind of shape. So I'd be interested in how closely they relate to the um, the interventions, the actions and improvements that you've already identified, are, there, are those improvements featured in the trajectories that are produced? Thank you. I, I, I'll come to Catherine in a second, but um, who uh, I think I, I probably could guess the charts that you're looking at in that regard with both outpatients and, and TTG. Uh, but um, yeah, there can there can be uh, improvements already built into to the numbers, um, and in some cases, there's a bit of averaging going on in terms of over which period. So sometimes it looks like a step where the reality is it's going to be more gradual. But that's just the, in the way that the numbers are committed back to government, as opposed to necessarily what is within an, uh, an internal plan. But Catherine, do you want to to add to that dis that uh, debate at all? Yeah, th thank you, David, and thank you, Susan, for the question. Um, the the um, trajectories have been um, developed based on the capacity that we knew we would have available through the job plans and through that's not just consultant job plans, but also specialist nurse job plans that we know have been available. Um, we have the we put the trajectories together. Um, in the early part of the year. So we were working on that through January, February time. And it had to draw assumptions. Obviously, sometimes we lose staff, etc. And you'll understand the operational challenges around these things. Um, we obviously have been working as well around the um, opportunities for improvement. So the Centre for Sustainable Delivery, we've talked about patient initiated returns and a variety of other initiatives that are designed to actually improve capacity. Um, we do need to become more sophisticated in terms of our ability to project exactly when each of those initiatives will come in and the various services, and there are many of them, and you, you'll understand the detail that sits beneath these high level trajectories. Um, obviously, there has been an allowance in terms of timelines and delivery of trajectory for um, holiday periods. You can see that as well because we know that capacity drops over those points in time. Um, and we also know historically we have always delivered much more in the second half um, in the in the last three quarters, I should say of the year than we have in the first quarter. So that's why the trajectory looks like that for both outpatients and also for inpatients. Um, we're also, as you'll be aware, um, commissioning some additional activity and some additional capacity from private providers. And the trajectories take some account of when those providers are able to provide us with that additional service as we're trying to work through the backlog and clear our waiting list. So, so that is the position. It will get more sophisticated as we, we get better at doing this. Um, but that's how those particular trajectories were put together for this financial year. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Uh, Alex, can I come to you, please? <clears throat> Thanks, David. I've got a, a couple of questions, but first a, a comment um, on the cancer treatment. Um, Lorraine gave us a, a very good presentation on the, the both the 31 and the 62 day and, and, and the work that's going on within that team at our last FRP. Um, so I, I, um, I agree with what you were saying about the fact that I think that action that was on the, the, the board, I think that can now be, or I would suggest that we can we can, we can close that now because I think that was that was a very good presentation and, and it certainly gave us a, a, an idea of where we're going and the tra that trajectory is definitely upwards on the 62 day, there's no two ways about it, but it'll take time, we know that. Um, that's not going to be an overnight um, rapid improvement, but it's certainly moving in the right direction. So, so Lorraine and the team and everybody concerned should be applauded for the, for the work we're doing. In terms of questions, I've got a question for Gareth and I've got a question for Louise. Um, Gareth's question, uh, a couple of questions. The, the the trend on the vacancy time to fill um, days by, by month that's there, 
it, it, it's consistently upwards, Gareth. It, it's been moving. It's, it looks like, and I'm, I'm half guessing what it is on the left hand side, but it looks like it's gone from about 117 back in July 2022 up to 125. Is that, is that the length of time that it takes from um, getting somebody that says, yes, I'm joining? to getting them insight, or is that from the vacancy being placed to somebody being filled? I couldn't quite understand what that what that, that was supposed to be telling us. And then the other question on, on the core mandatory e-learning, that's flatlining completely, and, and 62% or 64% rather isn't a number. I was hoping that we'd be improving that by, or seeing improvement in that by now, and that doesn't seem to be happening. As I said, looking from July, or the, the, the data at the bottom, from July 22 to, to May 23, it, it's just not moving the, 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 the line at all. So um, what are we doing about that and, and, and what can we as the board help uh, to improve that? Um, I'll let Gareth answer that and then I'll come back to Louise, if that's OK, David. Yeah, Gareth. Gareth. Yeah, thanks. Um, so on the first point, um, in terms of uh, vacancy time to fill, uh, I will need to just double check exactly the um, the specification of that measurement, um, but I think it's from the point that the advert goes right through to the process that uh, the, the the contract is uh, the the unconditional contract goes out to the individual. Um, so, but I, I will come back. I'll take that as an action just to double check um, in terms of the um, operational definition. Um, <clears throat> small work I would like to do with the with the team um, in relation, and there's an improvement plan being developed at the moment, which I'm I'm coming into that. A discussion you know into the post um and we'll want to look at that in terms of the measures within the pathway to understand where the delays uh, exist it is too long at the moment i would say that it's not inconsistent with my experience at the golden jubilee um we we went from um the 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 system that we have available to us job train was rolled out during the pandemic um with limited training available um and uh, uh that's not an excuse but it's an element of we do need to go back over this and understand do people know how to use the system effectively are we supporting people to use the system effectively um it does mean that certain aspects can take a little bit longer um although it gives us much so for example from a paper-based process although it's the right thing to do because the quality of the process improves overall if you can get the timelines right. So the, the um, robustness and the rigour around being able to have oversight of the process is much better with the electronic system. Um, shortlisting particularly can take a lot longer on, on, on the system, um, but there are ways of getting workarounds to that so people can work with them more, more effectively and more quickly. Um, so there's elements of making sure we bust some of the, 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 the cues in the system um, and there's also making sure that the uh, recruitment team's right sized for uh, doing their part of the job and we're not creating delays in there. Um, I think there are other wider issues to potentially look at. One of the things I'm, I also have experience around or have looked at, and I, I'm, not, I'm not promising we will be able to shift it quickly because it will be an element of national policy. Um, references, um, our approach to references in Scotland is based on a PIN policy that it's a number of years out of date, not out of date, but it's been in place for a number of years. And I do think we need to look at it again. It's based on having two references covering a minimum of the last two years, which is good practice. However, a lot of employers have, uh, we are recruiting from will have changed their practices. Many employers only provide um, a confirmation that somebody has worked for for the organisation. That's that's all you get it from from other organisations. So we need to make sure our processes are actually in keeping with the job market as a whole, uh, and that we're not. And that because I do know that references and getting references can be where we get a lot of problems, um, and particularly where people have got a uh, uh, a fairly fluid employment um, history over the course of the last few years. So um, I say first. Um, uh, fairly new in just in terms of uh, getting my head around exactly what the issues are, but those maybe hopefully that gives assurance that I have knowledge and understanding of this from a previous role. And it's uh, not particularly out of keeping, but we need to address it because it's not a good experience for managers and it's not a good experience for um, our, our, for uh, delegates going through through the or candidates going through the process. Um, I'll I'll and and the second one um, again is yes that needs to shift and we need to look at ways of, of moving that um and uh i think it's there's a number of things which are about come back to conversations we had earlier on board today 
which I think tie into, if you like, the, the core management or technical skills for our leaders and uh, across the organization. Um, it's it's not just the process, it's also valuing the processes we have in place. So appraisal, um, it links into um, uh, learning in the wider sense of what modules people up, up take up. Obviously, mandatory training is the things that we want everybody to be doing. Um, so the whole essence of it being important and valued and a priority um, needs to be embedded at the front line and it needs to be in, embedded across the organisation. So um, and so that, yeah, absolutely need to do more work on that. Thanks. And, and sorry, David, if I can ask Louise about the inpatient falls. Um, again, it's a number that, that is consistently rising. Um, or it, the last month it did drop a little bit, but if you actually look at the trend, it, it's gone up over the last 13 months. Um, so, and, and I'm aware in, in, in the words that were said, you know, things are trying to be done. It's just that no action at the moment seems to be having a, uh, the effect that we're looking for. Thanks, Alex. And I know Louise has also been involved in the initiatives around Statman training, so I'm going to be invited to make comment on both if I can. Thank you, David, and thank you, Alex. In relation to Statman, so just to continue on from that, there is an, a further improvement plan going to EDG this week for conversation because there has been some improvement, as, you, as you've noted, but in certain areas in particular, um, but it, we need to get a sustained improvement and we need to get a normal culture of everybody valuing Statman training and the core training that people have to do on top of that, that that's key to certain roles. So I think there's something about how we how we really get that message across that this is important, not just to the organisation, but to the individuals. So that, that, that hopefully we'll be able to, to share that plan more widely once we've got approval of, of, of the direction of travel. Um, in relation to falls, yeah, I totally agree. We need to we need to sustainably reduce that line, not have that gradual creep that we've had for a long period. And there is, and the, the, as it said, there the genuinely is a number of pieces of work, particularly in acute, but not exclusively so. We've also looking at those areas where we've now got single rooms where we previously had bays, for example, which has proved a challenge to us, and we're trying to work out how we do things differently, how we configure the way that the nursing teams work. So the, there's pockets of, of challenge in certain areas and there's also some really good practice going on. So so the, the nursing leadership in particular, but not exclusively, so there's obviously AHP colleagues, et cetera, that need to be involved in this, are revisiting this and having a refresh of what else can we do and what can we learn from other areas as well. Thanks, Louise. Thanks, Alex, for your question. Um, Joanne, can I come to you, please? Thanks, David. I think my points are for Catherine, if that's OK. I've got a couple. Um, I noticed in um, sections of your report, Catherine, that you mentioned about um, the patient hub, and I'm just wondering if you could give a bit more information on the rollout of that. I'm presuming it's the online patient booking um, system. Um, and then you also talk about virtual first um, within your report. Um, I guess I'm seeking assurance that we've still got a quality of access for patients and the range of appointments and kind of what's available to them and how are we ensuring that we're um, supporting those that aren't digitally enabled at this point in time? That would be my first question. Um, my second one is around um, page 16 of the report and the Treat Well. Um, I noticed that you talk in the report about a third MRI scanner plan being developed, which would give it extra capacity. And then on the risks, you've also got um, the removal of the MRI um, van. Um, are these interlinked? And could you give a bit more information on that, please? Thanks, Joanne. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, no, no problem. Thanks, Joanne, um, for the question. So in terms of patient hub, patient hub is a self-service system for people to access um, and a, an ability for us to communicate with patients more effectively. Um, so um, we have been going out to people asking if they still wish to remain on the lists and still wish to um, come in to see us. And as you know, the waiting lists have inflated over the period of time of COVID. Um, so we found that this system has been well received by users 
and they they appreciate the contact that we're making with them. It allows us to keep our waiting lists up to date and it avoids us um, wasting people's time contacting them and it helps us to reduce our DNAs, obviously, because we're getting to the right people. Um, that system is being rolled out across all service areas um, with a view to cleansing our waiting lists from an administrative perspective and indeed we're rolling it out across the return waiting list areas and also the um, the treatment time um, areas as well and asking people to communicate with us through that system. Um, there's a number of different functions within the system. We can also send letters. And so there are different parts of the system that now are becoming more familiar with it. We're switching different elements of it on. And there's a whole programme of work that is overseen through the Treat Well programme board and um, through the outpatients part of that specifically. You mentioned about um, how people feel about using an equity of access. So absolutely, we ensure that we take into consideration uh, any special requirements that patients may have. This isn't a blanket thing that will remove other sources of access for people. Um, and we would certainly um, take that into consideration through our communication with patients. We also um, are getting feedback through the um, certainly through the the near me application every time a consultation has been had there is an opportunity for people that are using the system to actually feed back to us and we're using that um, feedback to help drive improvements with service we've also gone out and we have communicated with patients and surveyed them in terms of how it feels for the non-virtual mechanisms and also telephone appointments. And we're taking all of that user feedback into consideration as we continue to, to refine our systems going forward with a view to it becoming much more person-centred and um, patient-centred. In terms of the third MRI scanner, um, at the moment we have um, MRI scanners obviously that are um, that come to us um, through private companies so there is a, a, a number of vans that turn up to provide additional capacity and plug in at the back of Rakemore Hospital. We have been working with the North Imaging Alliance which is uh, a, um, a system that's arranged through the North of Scotland planning group and has arranged for um, MRI vans to visit um, Orkney and Shetland and we're looking at the potential for those vans to also um, visit our rural general hospitals in the future. So we're looking at that. The third MRI scanner in particular relates to us looking at the potential for um, working with our research um, teams who um, obviously are wanting to um, offer the benefits locally for accessing service for research and we're linking with the UHI and um, other sent educational and research establishments and looking at that and, and running a partnership arrangement as has been done in Grampian and other health board areas. So that's the work in relation to the third MRI scanner. And just a point of note, there is also an MRI scanner going in at Dr Gray's hospital and we are in communication with Dr Gray's around collaborative efforts to ensure that that capacity can also be used in a joined up way. I hope that responds to your question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, John, for the question. I mean, I, I, I think the digital access question is, is one that will be ongoing. Um, Interestingly, the vast majority of feedback that we have from patients is that they welcome it and would want to see more, but recognising it's not for everyone. Um, so, uh, so it's it's the tension of of uh, being able to uh, provide that in a more accessible way for people who can access it in that digital or indeed, as Catherine's described by telephone, is also uh, a way that's appreciated by by patients. Um, Sarah, can I come to you, please? Thanks. Um, sorry, I know we're running a little bit short on time, but a question perhaps for Pam Kremen around delayed discharge. And it's more, I suppose, about what we're not seeing in this particular data set. 
um, around the kind of the flow and the length of stay. So I know in the top right hand box, we, we, it talks about the delayed discharges and the number of those that are classified as a code nine or a complex and the number that are kind of above that 30 day mark. I guess what I'm not maybe getting a feel from this data and it's maybe something we can go away and look at is is what does that flow look like in terms, you know, new ones in, ones out. And in terms of going back to something that we talked about right at the beginning of the meeting, um, and I think it was when Pam was talking about, you know, understanding, <laughs> using the data and understanding how we need to redesign the system or what that looks like. And I suppose I'm interested to understand what data we're capturing around those complex and really long delayed discharge to be able to help inform our redesign work in that space and as a flip side to that i'd be interested to understand the process because obviously at the at the end of these figures are people who are in hospital when hospital is not the best place for them and obviously the longer they're in that position and um, the more challenging it gets so yeah what's the process around the person and what can we look at in terms of data and flow and redesign thanks and um, <clears throat> thanks sarah um, yes, a, a really complex area. What you're seeing is the high level data. We do have um, lots of different data sets that, that we look at within particular programmes like our urgent and unscheduled care where we're looking at flow and whole system flow. So we'll have a number of, of data sets within that that would um, support, you know, plan date of discharge, for example, looking at length of stay, looking at, at where our interventions may have um, yielded positive outcomes for people in terms of the front door and not just admitting them and thinking about the, the, the flow through to, to some of the, the, the social care um, services that we do have. Um, we're really focused on daily oversight and um, focus planning for all people who are delayed. So they've all got an individual um, plan. And um, we have daily meetings within the districts. Um, each district manager has a daily meeting. We've got district management teams. Um, we've got also an opportunity, I guess, going forward wider in terms of um, our joint strategic plan engagement um, around um, really engaging with um, people in our community who need services and who would use services and their families and carers. Um, just around the, the, the people in place care, care services that we need to develop, they're going to take time. So we've got a number of um, immediate actions that we're taking, including being proactive around um, setting in place our um, forthcoming winter plans um, so that, that we can mitigate against um, people coming into hospital. Um, so we could provide more detailed um, data for the board. It, it does exist. So perhaps taking that into a, a development session and having a more of a deep dive might be something that, that we could do um, so that the, the position behind the data is much more understood and that the board could have more assurance about the short, ter short term, medium term and longer term actions that were taken around, um, you know, delayed discharges um, collectively, you know, across our, our health and social care and across our whole across our whole system in terms of what happens at the front door and how people move through that system and, and where some of the, the, the blockages are and where some of the opportunities for um, service developments um, are as well. Thanks, Pam. Does Thanks. that answer your question so far? Yeah. OK, uh, finally, let me come to Jerry. Thank, thank you, David. Uh, probably uh, two or three observations rather than questions, so don't anybody feel compelled to, to leap in with possible answers. Probably very similar theme to Sarah's comment there. I, I was very struck, and, I, and I, I've picked on three in particular here, the, the the scale of the challenge facing us in smoking cessation seems to be getting bigger, and so it's, it's, it's very it's very it's very it's very similar there to what we were talking about. Delayed discharges. I picked up the same issue as as Sarah there in terms of the I think it's sixty percent of our delayed discharges now exceeding thirty days, uh, which begins to suggest to me that actually that flow that Sarah talks about is probably very close to coming to a stop. Uh, so it's. It, it, 
I, I, and I know you picked this up in your introductory remarks, David, the endas, if you actually look at the trajectories there, it's actually quite a it's quite a scary picture in terms of, of, of where we might be going. So probably using those three in particular, and I say this, these are not questions, they're more observations in terms of how do we start to use the, 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 the projected and the trajectory information to actually say this is how we need to redesign our services in, in common with that theme we've had all morning rather than just looking at that absolute number of with an X today where we would like to be Y. It's actually say, well, this is almost a, I don't think it is a do nothing because I suspect the trajectories are based on what we've already put into the system. Where, where What more do we need to go? So thank you, David. Thanks, Jerry. I think really helpful comments. Um, and I think our challenge as an exec team and indeed coming from the uh, subcommittees who look at specifically at these areas, I think our challenge will be to communicate adequately, not just the result, but the action that is going with it to address it. Um, and uh, that's that's something uh, that we can always improve on. And there's a bit of a mixture, I would say, as we look at the IPQR, where it, it relates to that. I think um, most definitely looking at flow rather than queue, as Sarah has uh, suggested, is a much better way to, to measure capability um, as and, and looking at both of those things. Uh, are important. So thank you for your feedback around this. Uh, so thank you. That concludes it. Sarah, let me hand back to you. Thank you, David, but don't relax too much because you're up again in a minute. Um, so just to recap, uh, we were being asked to uh, note the report and the proposed level of assurance is moderate. Are members happy with that? And let me just change my view so I actually can see people. OK, great. I'm seeing some thumbs up. We're happy with that one. So I'll swiftly move us on then to item number seven. Um, another important uh, item for us to look at. This is our annual delivery plan. And I'm going to invite David to speak to this in just a second. But just um, a, a slight typo, which I need to bring people's attention to because it's important in terms of what we're being asked to do. So what is on the agenda is correct. We are being asked to approve this annual delivery plan. Um, there was just a slight typo on the S bar, um, so it's approving that we're doing. But I'll hand over to David. He'll talk us through it, and then we can make a decision at the end. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Sarah. So the report is submitted to you in the consolidated documents routine pages 130 to 210. I recognise that is substantial uh, reading. Um, the annual delivery plan is an important step for us as a board uh, each year as we submit what effectively is our contract with Scottish Government with regard to uh, our activity and performance. It doesn't capture everything that we're doing, but it does uh, capture uh, a fair part of what we're doing. And the format that is requested from government changes from year to year with particular areas uh, of focus. A previous draft of this document, in fact, indeed, the draft that was submitted to Scottish Government uh, was reviewed uh, within the Finance uh, Performance and Resources Committee um, and uh, was uh, discussed there. But uh, since then, we have altered the uh, formatting of that in particular to align with the Together We Care strategy for the Highland area so that it becomes under more familiar headings for uh, the board. But the annual delivery plan doesn't just cover uh, the Highland area, but also uh, it covers Argyll and Butte. And uh, again, you'll see as part of the document uh, the reference to the Joint Strategic Plan um, uh, for Argyll and Butte and the submissions th thereafter. There are specific areas in the report that are primarily across acute services, and you'll see that's why they aren't necessarily responded to uh, in each of those occasions from uh, Argyll and Butte, and hence the reason why there's a, a difference in uh, the submission. Um, there are additional items other than this document, and indeed I see that in this document the embedded files and appendices uh, the, the functions will not work to click on them because it's been converted to PDF. Uh, we will make them available to uh, colleagues uh, should you desire them, um, but they are the detailed numerical submissions that go with this plan um, that gets used 
uh, not only ourselves, and you'll see that as it starts to appear in the IPQR, but also uh, used uh, within government. Um, I think it's also uh, fair to say that you will see uh, the submission is at different levels of maturity, um, depending on the topic area. Some are very detailed and numerical, and some are more directional. Um, and the intention, of course, is to build those out and be more specific in the areas that are still uh, somewhat in development. Uh, throughout the year, the ADP does get updated, and uh, that is a, a refresh that will be done with more information that gets added through the year, and that will become uh, more available to uh, the board as a whole. The initial uh, feedback from government is that they are pleased with the document that we have uh, submitted. Um, I would say that we are never satisfied with the documents that we submit in that respect, and therefore, uh, you know, we, we're in a very challenging uh, space. But uh, nonetheless, it's good to get that uh, feedback from government, but we will continue uh, to work on this document for future submissions. Um, that it fully meets our need. And as Sarah says, uh, it's presented for um, uh, moderate assurance and for approval uh, by the board today and happy to open up uh, to questions. I should say I'm also joined by Jane Gill, whose uh, team have been heavily involved in developing the document you've got in front of us. And um, between us, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions that you may have for us. Thank you, David. Um, in addition to the grinders that were happening out earlier, I now have some kind of tractor festival happening outside my window. So uh, I'm just trying to hear what everybody's going to say. Um, I'm going to open this up for questions. I've got a couple, but I'll bring others in first and then maybe the tractors will have gone. Uh, Alex. Yeah, <coughs> thanks for that, David. Yeah, we, we saw this FRP and we were happy with it. Um, one of the things, and I think we mentioned it at the FRP, um, one of the things is, is quite a few of the um, actions are required to be done by the 31st of July. Um, now, I mean, uh, uh, there, there was there was one um, optimize um, ambulatory emergency care, optimize patient flow by increasing proportion of patients on RAC short stay pathway by 10%, improve flow group two performance by from 75 to 85. It was the same um, above about uh, admissions downstream, ward areas where appropriate, etc. Because it's the 31st of July date. Have you have we got the information now? Because somebody's going to say, have you done that? Or have those already slipped because we haven't got the ADP in technically? So no, the 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 um they haven't slipped because of any documentation element. We're not waiting for the approval. We recognise that that it's and it's the same every year that. Uh, the timing of the submission of the document doesn't quite align with all of the, the board agendas, but nonetheless, we treat these as live documents and live commitments, you know, pending the, the formalities. Um, I think with some of the dates, um, I, I would say it's one of the areas that we need to work on because sometimes these are start dates as opposed to completion dates. And some, so I, I think those are, are ones in particular that, that we need to um, uh, pay quite close attention to because uh, in some of these it's about programmes of work uh, as opposed to any specific uh, item. Um, but that certainly is is one of the areas of it. In terms of the review uh, of it, we still um, have oversight primarily through um, our programme boards and our SLTs with regard to uh, the delivery uh, of this. And uh, while we might be again refreshing uh, our governance around that so that it's um, using uh, the best oversight possible and the right use of time, uh, then we will be monitoring the updates uh, with regard to the ADP in that regard too. Thanks, David. Um, I've got a question which I'll ask us now and gives people time to think if they've got any other questions they want to come in with. Um, so really pleased to hear that um, the Scottish government were pleased with what we had submitted. Um, I think hopefully people have picked up as you're reading through it. It's probably not the easiest document to um, to use in terms of being able to articulate the work and the ambition and, and the challenge. So uh, well done, everybody, for, for being able to kind of squash it into that format. And, and good to hear that we've got that positive feedback. Um, I suppose 
a couple of observations. You already touched on it, David, that what's in this particular plan actually actually isn't everything. There's there's more that we're doing. Um, can you believe it? Because there's quite a lot in the ADP as it is, but there's more on top of that. And I'm thinking back to a comment in an earlier discussion around how we make real our strategy. How do we deliver our strategy? Now, clearly what's in this ADP articulates a portion of that, but not perhaps all of it. So I've got a question around how are we going to articulate the whole picture in a way that this board can get assurance around it in terms of delivering the strategy? Um, and then kind of tagged on to that, recognising that this is a massive document and then there is more, that huge scale and volume of work, I suppose, feels enormous and, and just kind of I don't know what my question is there really it's just a, an observation it feels like an absolutely enormous piece of work um and I suppose I'm thinking about our approach around that thanks I, I, I will start to answer that and maybe other colleagues will will come in uh, beyond that um I, I think the, the it's fair to say that yes we've got ten and a half thousand employees or thereabouts who are who are involved in delivering what is both within the ADP as well as what's in the broader strategy. Um, the, this, these both strategy and the ADP are not necessarily centrally um, generated and then pushed out to the organisation, but actually a reflection of what comes through the organisation, which is then centrally overviewed and then pushed back out again. Um, so it's not new news to the services who are already delivering. Um, however, sometimes the subtleties of what is required within delivery uh, are reflected in a different way or articulated in a different way from the services that they would. So, uh, nor can we then leave this and say this is only a collection of what comes from above. So we need to be able to reinforce that message both top down as well as and that engagement is going to be important as we do so. Uh, the reality of how we do that is across every possible means that we have engagement with our teams. Um, and so that, uh, you know, as an executive team and indeed as a board, it's important that we are able to engage with people as we meet them uh, with regard to the delivery plan and with regard to uh, the strategy. Um, so uh, the, 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 uh, my colleagues may well come in and Boyd's going to come in in a second and uh, happy to invite you in Boyd now. Uh, thanks, David. You probably covered a fair bit of it. Um, yeah, so what is the ADP and what do we need as a board to think about in that? Um, so first of all, um, we have to express the government something that gives, if you like, the totality of the measurables and the, the things that it, it needs to see that we are doing on behalf of the public that live in this part of Scotland. At the, um, under the instruction of NHS Scotland and the Scottish Government, there's an awful lot of things that are measured and that are required to deliver services and um, getting all of that down on a page is difficult and that's why it's not one page but it's a really big thing. That then makes it very difficult for anybody to oversee which is where the board comes in because we oversee things like this but this is huge. When it gets to government <clears throat> it'll get split into component parts and it'll go to all the various departments. That's a different engagement. So the only groupings that will look at the bigger picture of this and try especially to contextualise it against our strategy, which is a high level intentional document developed in a very specific and inclusive way towards where we get to in the next five years, um, it's us and the, the, mainly the executive director group. So those two groups particularly, and perhaps the, if we're cooking on gas, the governance committees as well. So you try to reference one against the other because if it's in the strategy, it probably ought to be reflected somewhere in the ADP. But the ADP is not fulfilling. That's not the master of the ADP. It's probably our, if you like, contract almost with the government for all the things we have to do and that that's its real master. 
for any department, division, ward or team out there, if they're doing work that is very required and prioritised work, uh, at which government and NHS Scotland wants particularly to happen and which we want because of um, our strategy, um, it is of value to that team or department to see that they are on the page somewhere. And so some of what the ADP, yeah, OK, it's very detailed, but actually um, it could be possible for people to feel a bit left out if their important work isn't recognised as part of the important overall work plan for the board. And therefore, what we have is a very long document, uh, um, one which um, is trying to serve several different masters and, and is looked at from several different important angles all of which are valuable, but uh, are different. And I think that's just my uh, a sort of summary of what it is and maybe what it isn't and what it has to do um, to help us as a board to think of it in our space just now. Thanks, Boyd. Um, Pam, you wanted to come in? Yeah, great, great question, Sarah. And absolutely the question of the moment, how do you, how do you make this clear? And how do we have surveillance of it? And, not, and obviously, from a board perspective, that's at a high level. So there's, for me, there's two aspects for us. One is the um, the annual touch base on how we think we're doing with our strategy and the so what question, and our IPQR and the development and maturing, maturing of our IPQR and the key triangulation and measures that we bring to the board. That's That's the bit that needs to sit here. Because as Boyd and David have talked about, the level of detail, and when you get into this level of operational detail, it, it that would just become really messy and would take us into the, the wrong place. The, the second part for us as an AGG, which is the bit we're trying to nail, is the is that kind of, you know, that that tweaked recipe, that kind of communication engagement in terms of how do you bring this into something more coherent for teams and departments and teams or districts at that level that gives you service planning and um, so that people are clear about the tasks and the focus and the priorities consistently and and that that golden thread reads right through from the strategy to the to the front line and and indeed gets us the outcomes we're looking for so to me from an EGG perspective looking looking ac across the strategic leadership and governance of the organization we need to make sure our reviews of the strategy and the papers that we bring forward that show the progress are, are robust and backed up by the evidence in terms of performance, not just quantitative, but also what do we understand from a qualitative perspective about so what outcomes for people, people's experience, etc. Um, but uh, as leaders of the system, how we embed that performance management right down to frontline team level, and that that becomes the way we do our business and gather our information. But but there is good service planning and we still have a bit of a journey to go on on getting that um, methodology and approach in place. And, and I mean, the evidence will tell you for high performing organisations, reliant, reliable, consistent methodology it doesn't actually matter which one you use as long as you get one that everybody becomes familiar with and they start to orientate themselves to, you will then start to get a clearer articulation of results. And that's, I think, you know, that is the journey that we're on. And, and we are at the moment trying to look at how we pull that down onto, pay, on, onto a report that sets that sets that kind of direction, if you like. So that, that that's that's where my head's at. And that is the work that we're doing. And as part of the where we started the conversation in terms of my uh, report. Thanks, Pam. Um, Gareth, did you want to come in on this or was it on something else? On this? Yeah. Just a brief point, I think. Um, again, just coming from Golden Jubilee, it's something we grapple with there as well. And Boyd mentioned it, is that it's, it's, it serves a purpose for government. It's very granular. It's a level of detail that is to some extent helpful for them, but forces us into actually looking at probably too much detail uh, at that, this level. So it comes back to a point around distributed leadership and how actually those actions need to be, we need to be assured that actions are being taken forwards within the areas and that the, the ownership is sitting in those areas. Um, so there's a bit for me about 
appropriate aggregation of reporting so that you actually wrap it up into something that's going to be meaningful for the board. So uh, that comes back to the IPQR. I think it's one key critical thing. We had a similar uh, mechanism in Golden Jubilee and program management reporting, and that is about how you aggregate it. And again, that's a journey you go on. Um, but we need to take our managers and leaders with us. Men really, I mention it is because conversations I've had with Pam in the first couple of weeks here is around <clears throat> what some of the technical skills might be that we need to include in our leadership and development um, program uh, and how we get people used to that kind of drumbeat of um, program reporting what what needs to be escalated um, and highlighted because that's kind of one of the key mechanisms I think for us understanding what's on track what's not on track and what can what can what can we do to support them as opposed to getting into the minutiae of detail for each individual item within a program. Thanks, Gareth. No, I would absolutely agree that, that about that, you know, the point around it being meaningful for the board, that's really important. Um, but also, and it might not be the same thing, but meaningful for our staff and our teams who are really invested in the vision of our strategy. Um, and, and we need to help articulate that, you know, the work that they're seeing on a daily basis links into that strategy. And that might be two different things. But um, I think, as Pam kind of said, that's the that's the challenge ahead for us. Um, I'll bring in Muriel and then I think we'll probably be done with this one so Muriel please. Uh, thank you uh, Gareth has sort of touched on um, what I was um, thinking uh, along because this really links into the first item on the agenda today as well I I feel at, at board level and I think the flow might for me um, would have helped a wee bit but I think we also I think it was Gareth that mentioned uh, communication and, and the, the various granular levels I think we also need to again um, as a non-exec recognise that there are medical advances and uh, different ways of delivering services that don't fit the whole of the board and I think we need to give assurance um, to use that word that th there will be access to services to to clinical care because sometimes I think we get we've, we can get a bit bogged down why can we not get this in area A or area B so I think it's just linking all the all the pieces of this uh, at national and local level and again linking it back into the first paper of today. Thank you. Thanks Muriel and um, yeah absolutely agree with that. Um, okay so uh, just to recap there and again just to remind people it's what's on the agenda that's correct so we were being asked to um, take moderate assurance from the report and approve the annual delivery plan is everybody okay with that yep okay great seeing thumbs up and nodding that's fantastic so I'm going to move us on now to our Next item, and then we'll, we'll have a little lunch break after that. So the next item, uh, I'll be inviting Tim to speak to us. Uh, this is agenda number, sorry, agenda item number eight, and it is our corporate parenting update. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much. I think this is, this is found in the papers immediately after the ADP report. I think on page two eleven. Um, corporate parenting is a uh, an important responsibility um, for the uh, for the board. Um, it's one that's been a little bit quiet, particularly, I think, within the Highland Health and Social Care Partnership area, um, perhaps uh, perhaps because of the lead agency arrangements. Um, but it is vital that we take those responsibilities on board. And we have had training last year um, coming in a, 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 in a, a development session with the board. Um, the purpose of this report is for uh, awareness, um, particularly in the Highland Health and Social Care Partnership area, because uh, developments are more certainly more advanced within Argyll and Butte, and plans um, plans are in place in the Health and Social Care Partnership there. And it's to note our uh, responsibilities around corporate parenting and to um, set out indicatively uh, where we are. Uh, from a, uh, a Highland Health and Social Care Partnership point of view, uh, and the work that needs to be uh, uh, needs to be done, um, we have um, quite a few tasks and quite a few uh, plans that need to be put in place. But it's important to make sure that those plans have adequate consultation, particularly um, 
that we engage uh, well with um, care experienced children and young people and are able to to link in and uh, and make sure that we have realistic um, plans and uh, uh, and that they will improve the health and well-being of those people who do have some of the uh, biggest challenges and and um, in in some cases have um, uh, particular uh, 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 particular health challenges and it's a fairly broad agenda because it it's, uh, it includes both our, our responsibilities um, to work on the partnership agenda our responsibilities to make sure that our services are appropriately tailored for care experienced people um, and uh, uh, and also we have our responsibilities as a major employer, as an anchor institution to look at, um, for example, how, what, how our employment works and how careers can potentially be developed uh, for people who are uh, who are care, ex uh, who are care experienced. Um, so, as I said, arrangements in Argyll and Butte are, 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 are quite well advanced. We've got more work to do um, within uh, Highland HSCP, we will be um, developing um, a formal strategy to go through the or formal plan to go through to go through our uh, governance processes over the next few months. Um, it will be helped by what we hope will be the forthcoming replacement appointment of our child health commissioner. The role was um, held by Sally Amor in the past, but she she left several well, quite a few months ago. It's taken some time to get that role um, uh, uh, sorted out and re-advertised, but that's out to advert at the moment. And so we're hoping to recruit someone in a matter of a couple of weeks time. Um, and that will offer a uh, very helpful capacity to be able to uh, to continue this work. Uh, in the meantime, we've been uh, engaging with um, uh, the uh, the Promise Board, or the new name for the Corporate Parenting Board covering the Highland Council area, um, and are looking to uh, Develop, develop that further. There's a very vibrant group of care experienced uh, children and young people within Highland um, and uh, uh, we we have a, a great opportunity to work with them and to uh, improve the way that we relate and our services are, are uh, are provided. So the the this report is is just presented for um, awareness uh, and noting. And as I say, the uh, the plan and the uh, and the uh, rag rating are essentially indicative. Um, so I'm not asking to uh, to approve that, but I'm be uh, welcome to take any comments or questions. That's great. Thank you, Tim. Um, OK, I'll open up. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Tim? Alex, please. Yeah, Tim, the, the rag rating, I noticed you said it's indicative. Um, it just always concerns me when I see a series of plans, and this being one of them, um, where you've got two done, which were, to be honest, relatively straightforward to do, and every other one is sitting at amber. Um, what... What's happening to move that forward? I mean, I know it's an annual thing, um, but it, it, it's just seeing the ambers worries me. I'd, I'd be more worried, of course, if they were red, but the, the amber does does worry me a little bit from there. Is, is it because you haven't got the person that, um, in, in the position yet that, that you need? Is it the lack of resource? What's the, what's the cause? No, essentially, it, uh, it's around capacity, and uh, a lot of the a lot of the work, uh, work the the practical work would be done by by uh, um, uh, by the child health commissioner, which is a, I mean it's a statutory appointment, and we 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 are getting that person. Uh, 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 assuming the appointments the appointment goes uh, goes well as it, uh, as I anticipate it will uh, in place very soon. So I th I, I suppose like. It's. Um, I suppose you've got to say that that we need to pay more attention to the area, so it gets back to priorities to an extent as well. So, so there are specific individuals who uh, uh, we need to get working more in that, but it's also around giving the giving the. Um, uh, uh, 
um, giving corporate parenting the, uh, the 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 priority it deserves. So I think it's uh, and, and that's that's why the assurance. Uh, um, uh, it's certainly not substantial assurance. That's one of the reasons why I put down. I mean, it's for awareness, but it's only moderate assurance because there is a there is quite a long way to go. Um, but I think if we get to um, the end of the financial year and the RAG ratings haven't changed very considerably, um, then that, that would be a real concern. And, and I'd expect um, non-executive members to be uh, to, to, uh, to raise more significant concerns around that. Um, but but uh, I, I'd be, uh, I'm confident that we can make considerable progress over the next six months. Six to nine months. Thanks, Tim. And actually, you, you might have kind of touched a little bit on a question I had there. So you'd said, you know, if we get to the end of the financial year. And so I was going to ask a question about when when do we see this again um, or, or, you know, at what points in the future does this get um, scrutinised again just to be able to track that progress? So, I mean, it'll go to other places other than just here, but I wonder if you could say a little bit about um, that scrutiny and assurance yeah, timeline. The, the, the yeah, the intention is to have the plan in place um, from uh, uh, from April 2024. So the work on the so that would be actually in place by then to cover that period. So that's that's the time scale that we'd be um, looking at. Um, but and I think the governance and the scrutiny and also the engagement of uh, care experienced people is. Uh, a, a particular reason why um, I was wanting this this not to be something formal, because I think it hasn't gone through the processes to be formal. It could have been an action. It could have been more of a formal action plan to get to get the process up and ask for approval. But I don't think that will be right. Um, I think it. it we're, I'm looking for it to um, uh, come back to the well, the papers to come back to the board if that's what board members want early on in 2024. OK, um, yeah, I think it would be good to to look at that again. Um, like you said, I think it's very important uh, that we remain sighted on this so we can take a note of that on our um, on our work plan for the board to make sure that we bring it back at the right point in time. Um, I'm going to bring Anne in next with a question, Anne. So um, I'm very pleased to see us discussing this particular topic. Uh, not that long ago, um, myself and a number of other uh, people within the organisation, including um, our chief executive, attended a really interesting and energising event at the townhouse in Inverness, which was very much focused on um, peer experienced young people and indeed led by them or themselves. Uh, so there is a great resource out there for us to draw on. And so I, I just wanted to, uh, I'm not sure if I have a question exactly, but explore a couple of areas. One is um, around the engagement piece and uh, how we can uh, link up and engage people with care experience uh, right throughout our business, not just on how we uh, fulfil our corporate parenting duties. Um, I'm not sure if Ruth's with us today, but I'm conscious I was I'm conscious um, that there are a number of ways in which we celebrate and focus on the needs of particular uh, groups of people, such as our recent support for the Pride events, um, such as our work around carers. Um, and I know that there is a number of sort of national and local initiatives which promote um, engagement with care experienced young people. Um, there was a recent, I think the first time since COVID, a love rally in Glasgow. There's a national care day. There's a care experienced week. Um, so I suppose one of my questions is whether um, we can get involved with those kinds of initiatives and uh, promote uh, our support for care experienced young people very publicly uh, like that. 
uh, but also how we can work with uh, Highland Champs and the care experienced young people that we do have in the area to bring them into relevant parts of our redesign discussions um, uh, and other areas of our work, uh, not just this plan. So that, that was one area that I'd, um, you know, I'd, I'd urge us to explore and think about and, and see what more we could do there. Um, and the other thing that struck me when I was reading this is that, um, and, and I think it's a, a, a feature of how care experience young people themselves um, advocate uh, for their needs, is that people are care experienced throughout their life. And so I was also thinking about how uh, this particular topic relates more broadly to how we approach health inequalities, um, you know, because we know <clears throat> that uh, care experienced people do experience health inequalities, not just when they're young, presumably. Um, and so, uh, uh, again, I'd be interested to see what Tim's um, reflections would be on how this area of work relates to or should be represented in our wider work on health inequalities. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Anne. Thank I don't know, Tim, if you wanted to take the last yes, bit of I mean, the question I think, I think, and then... Well, can I just, just quickly cover, cover some of Anne's points? And, um, uh, I mean, I think, I think the points you make are, 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 are very pertinent, Anne. I mean, I think around health inequalities, um, you're absolutely right, people who are care experienced will uh, are very often have um, Particular health challenges, uh, which, which go on for men uh, for uh, uh, for for many many years. I mean, in I mean, I, I've I've seen relatives of mine um, who uh, who've been care experienced have problems go, go throughout throughout their life, even when becoming really old uh, and and um, reflecting some of the issues from their earlier care experience. So so I think that um, it, it's one of the groups. Uh, of people and one of the parts of our population who we we certainly need to pay particular attention to and be conscious of the needs and we need also to bear in mind of course that many of our staff will be care experienced and uh, and we 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 have a range of um different um exposures and opportunities to make things better and to use the experience of those who are care experienced. I think just quickly on the first point that you make, I think that's one of the things that we really need to look at as part of our planning is how we do engage that that, that there's a sense in with when I've heard lo some local care experienced young people talking, they they're looking for action. They're not looking for further consultation. Um, that's not to say that that we that it's not be uh, really good ideas to involve people in how we do planning and transformation, but it's what we can actually do uh, that that really makes a difference for them around dislocation of care, um, but also around things like employment and skills opportunities, which I'm sure are, uh, uh, are uh, we, we can offer in a, we can offer in abundance. So I haven't got any easy answers for the first. Uh, to the particular first question, because I think it's very fundamental, but it's something that we need to make sure that the plan uh, really uh, well covers. Thanks, Tim. And I know Gareth and Ruth had popped their hands up, I think probably more in relation to the first part of Anne's question, but um, I'll bring Gareth in first. Thanks, Chair. Um, I think it's something I'm keen to look at in terms of the employee uh, employer um, opportunities we have. Um, and it also links to the Anchor Institute organisation concept as well. So um, in terms of what we can do to support employment opportunities, uh, I, I'm keen to look at bringing something back through committees and to the board around probably the wider diversity and inclusion um, strategy from a perspective of employer responsibilities, um, which also covers age as a protected characteristic um, and so that covers that element of throughout the lifetime um, and within that what's our employability framework um, and what, what opportunities can we structure um, something that sets out clearly what we're doing to act within the anchor organization concept providing opportunity 
for both developing skills to go on for onward employment, possibly in health and social care. That would be great if we can get them to come to health and social care. But we also have the opportunity to support people on their employment journey onwards elsewhere. So we can offer um, placements, volunteering um, opportunities for apprenticeships. So in some respects, I'm agnostic to where people end up in employment. It's, uh, it's be great if it's health and social care, but if we can play a part as an anchor organisation to helping people get into employment um, and some of the examples I'd pull out would be care experienced individuals, but also um, similarly, um, which they might cross over would be people with long term unemployment. So again, people that are from difficult uh, are in a difficult position to get back into employment. We can we can have some uh, we have a lot of insight into how to support people that we could draw from across the organisation to make that work effectively. Um, so I think it's about two things. One is about the how we provide services, and I think that's what Ruth will probably touch on in terms of how we engage with people effectively to make sure they're designed in the right way and take into account people's uh, views, including care experience. And the other is then what we can do as an employer and employability. Thanks, Gareth. Um, Ruth? Thanks, Sarah. Yeah, I think um, Tim and Gareth have both touched on some of what I, I would have said there. So I'll just add very briefly, indeed, around the community engagement side um, for that particular sort of community of interest or community of experience there, care experience people. Um, so we would encourage all services to, whenever they're thinking about a service change and improvement innovation, uh, to think about all of the people that might be affected by that service change. Um, and in particular, people who they might not normally see or hear from as much, um, but that might be because we haven't reached out to them. So that could include care experienced people. Um, and our engagement framework would encourage them to go out and engage with those people around that change, as indeed we should be engaging with all of all of the people that we provide services to continually, if at all possible. Uh, but my team's very happy to support that work with any service that um, particularly is coming up to a change that might affect that group, um, whether that's disproportionately or indeed whether they work specifically with that group anyway. Um, I'd also say, uh, of course, any service who's looking at a change like that should be doing an, uh, an equality impact assessment as well. So that's quite a, a good formalised way of looking at the, the different um, communities that might be affected. And although people tend to think of that as being about the specific protected characteristics, the NHS Highland uh, guidance around equality impact assessments does encourage us to look at other aspects as well, like inequality. And that could also in include care experience. So that's another way to try and pick that up. And on the communication side, I think Anne mentioned the Pride campaign we did recently, and we really take our lead from the ADP. So trying to look at what the key priorities are for the organisation there that we could support with communications campaigns and uh, any services uh, who are keen to work specifically around care experience. I'm happy to work with them as well. Thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Um, OK, I've got Jerry next with a question, please, Jerry. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Again, uh, it's probably more of an observation uh, and uh, risking keeping people away from the, the lunch. Uh, probably like Anne, I was delighted to see this re this report uh, on the agenda uh, today. Uh, and what, what I've been reflecting on over the last few days, I think nationally, I, I think if we even if we were being at our kindest, the, the national evaluation of the first couple of years of the implementation of the promise would be poor or very poor. And I think that was... Uh, so. So I'm delighted to see this high level action plan, as, as Tim has indicated. I think we need to have a think about how we take this take this forward. I would be very concerned if the next time we spoke about this was 12, 13, 14 months away. Uh, so I think we have to think about that and how we actually see the granularity of how some of these areas are taken forward, because we, we, we're all aware of the, the the data and the intelligence on the long term impact, as Tim has said, of adverse childhood events. It, it, it doesn't need to be questioned. It's there. It's there for everyone to see. It, 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 it affects these young people through the rest of their lives. So I think this really needs to come up high up our agenda. And actually, we need to have a think about how we're actually going to fulfil our responsibilities as corporate parents. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Um, and I'm actually I'm happy to take an action away from that. And maybe I can have a conversation with um, colleagues offline about about exactly that, where we bring it back and when we bring it back and, and just make sure that that is keeping it, as you said, Jerry, at the right level on the right agenda so that we're not um, losing track of it, but taking into account all the all the elements that Tim pulled in earlier as well. Um, Alex. 
Yeah, just to follow on from Jerry, just on a bit, which subcommittee, I mean, where would this go? Is, is it a health and social care partnership? Where does it sit? Because that's that's a place that maybe we could do more of the the um, the checking of the of the the progress against it. So I would maybe defer to somebody else who knows better than me, but as I would see it, I would be expecting it to go to the to um, Highland Health and Social Care Committee. But also, I suppose, but we also have to see it as in we've seen it here because we are the corporate parents as well. So I, but Pam's probably going to come in with a with the exactly the right answer. So I'll bring you in, Pam. No pleasure. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely. I think you know children's the children's services aspect and I think this is goes back to what Tim said at the beginning how we keep children's services um and family services as a as a priority agenda item is 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 something for us that integrated space the health and social care partnership but absolutely on this one we have a very specific duty as an NHS board regardless of any of those other arrangements so <clears throat> there are there are, but but I also think as a board we need to make sure that we keep children's priorities you know front and foremost with ourselves as well we need to be cited on them albeit maybe some of the details getting done between the partnership and the health and social care uh, social care committee thanks pam so um i will alex i'm going to take that away as an action for myself um, to have a look at and i can update um, you all in due course OK, so just to recap there, the proposed level of assurance was um, moderate. And I think Tim explained kind of why he was pitching it at that level and we're being asked to note the content of that. Are we content to do that? Yep. Great. OK, let's take a well earned lunch break. We're a little bit behind the timings on the agenda, but I'm going to say that we still take our full half an hour. Uh, see you back here just at the back of 140. OK. Thank you.